Hi there, I'm Kurt Steinbruck, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Wesley Chapel, Florida, and we are going through the book of Romans in this series. It's a video series as well as a blog series that we're doing here at Faith Lutheran Church, and uh, if you've missed our previous videos, you can catch them on our YouTube channel or by going to faithwesleychapel.com to our blog, which is under the About Us drop-down menu, and you can catch all of the the videos and the blog posts for the Roman series, as well as other series that you can find there. And uh, today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 20, oh, 24 to 24. How about that one? 24 to 25. Let me bring that up. There we go. And before we do, let's pray. So Heavenly Father, please be with us as we study your word today, as we spend time with you. And we just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive that word as the truth that you always give us, and that that word would be at work in us, changing us, transforming our minds, drawing us closer to you, creating faith, doing all of the things that your word does. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Romans 7, 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I, myself, serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so we have a lot of uh, interesting terminology in this and just kind of uh, interesting things that are said here, the phrases and everything. So let's go through that to start with. So the, the term wretched, what does that mean? Uh, it's referring to the turmoil and the distress that the speaker is feeling as he's looking at this, this conflicted life that he's leading, that where he wants to do what God commands, but he finds himself sitting. That brings him to utter turmoil and distress because he also, he realizes the, the utter uh, futile or futility that word, futileness, of, of his, his actions, and he realizes the sinfulness of so much of his life, and it leaves him in a, in a hopeless place. So he's feeling that turmoil, that distress, and so he's asking, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Now, one of the questions throughout this entire section of verses 14 through 23 is, who is the I? Who is the I who is speaking through this? And there's really there's a few different ideas, but three that stand out. So one is that some people would say the I is Adam, that this is actually talking about Adam before uh, the fall and then after the fall. Another um, under, another interpretation of it is that the I is a non-believer coming to faith. And so the non-believer uh, is sinning, but then at the end, he's able to have this confession of faith. Uh, where he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then the third interpretation is that the I is the believer, is a believer that is confessing the day-to-day -day struggle that they have with sin. So which is it? Well, um, in terms of it being Adam, there's a lot of issues actually with that. So the Adam interpretation, it, it doesn't hold up very well. The, the first thing is just the language itself. It's using personal uh, pronouns and sometimes emphatically personal pronouns, which would be very strange to do if you're talking about someone else, if, you know, because Paul's writing this and it would be strange for him to talk about Adam in this way, using the I in that way. It also doesn't really fit in the, the context of the language of the struggle. We don't see Adam dealing specifically with that. So it's, it, it doesn't hold up very well, but that's, People are trying to kind of, there's there's a tendency to want to push away from this being a confession of a believer because, uh, you know, we want to think that we can overcome all of this, that, that we're not so, uh, that we don't have such a struggle with sin, that we're able to, at some point, push sin off. And so we're, we kind of look for ways to explain that away. So another one of those is that the eye is the non-believer who's coming to faith. Well, now we have and, and specifically, usually it's Paul. So it's Paul before he he uh, has his uh, moment of 
conversion on the road to Damascus and then Paul afterwards. And so, you know, in, in some ways it's, it's appealing because Paul wanted to follow God's law then. And so, but now it's, you know, did he not think that he was? Well, we don't really get that sense from Paul. We don't get a sense from the things that he wrote that he struggled with his righteousness or his sin, like it was some inner turmoil before he came to faith. In fact, he speaks of it very, very much like, hey, I, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I did everything. So he really gives the impression that he was trying to follow God's law and he felt like he was doing it, like he was living it. Um, of course, he wasn't. And he knows that now, but to have him take his understanding now and apply it to them in this way would be be kind of strange. So that one's a little a little difficult. And then to to call it, you know, to think of it in another sense, just as any non-believer. I mean, it, first of all, earlier in Romans, it talks about how without Christ, we have no, you know, like we're, we're spiritually dead. We're enemies of God. We don't want to do his work. And, um, you know, so, and then of course, even in this section, it says that in our flesh, we, there's nothing good. So the idea that this is a non-believer who's desperately trying to do God's law and loving God, but then failing at it, it, it doesn't seem to hold up very well. So then there's that last thing, right? So the idea that it's the believer who's struggling with the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, battle between sin and, and his love for God. And that would be, um, I think that's the one that holds up the best. It's it's Paul just being very open and honest. So it's using the personal pronouns, those emphatic personal pronouns, because Paul's writing it about himself. He's talking about a struggle that I think if we're honest, we all know that we deal with. And in the end, it fits very well with what he's taught in the other parts of Romans, how we have this uh, this sinful flesh that we're battling against. We look at in uh, chapter six, just right before this, how he's telling the people, don't, you know, you've been freed from sin. Don't go back into slavery from sin. You need to serve righteousness. Well, if we just all did that, there'd be no reason to tell you to do that because it wouldn't be a struggle. But he knows there's a struggle. He puts it out there. Okay, you need to serve righteousness. You need to serve God because the law is good, even though, Sin does all these horrible things to us through the law. And then ultimately, you know, it leaves you where you're like, okay, I want to do this. I want to follow this. But then you have the reality check of we still sin and we still struggle with that. And that's what leads us to being that wretched person, that distressed person. We're distressed because we do love God. And we have that new uh, new mind and that new life that God has given us that wants to serve. We have the spirit living us. We want to do it. And yet we so often sin. And so that's the, the struggle. So then it continues on, right? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, this, not so much a question as it is a rhetorical st uh, tool to bring in the answer. He wants to tell us what is the hope for this. So I'm a wretched man. I'm in turmoil. I'm in utter distress because I know my sinfulness and I can't seem to ever beat it. Who's going to deliver me, right? So if the big thing here is that he's not looking, how am I going to overcome this? He's saying, who's going to rescue me? Because he knows that he cannot win this battle. He needs someone else to come and rescue him. So who is going to rescue me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? So the one who's going to rescue you, it's only Jesus. Jesus is the only one who's going to rescue you. What is he rescuing me from? From this body of death. Now, Here's another area where people have kind of gone off the rails just a little bit where, okay, well, he wants to rescue, he needs rescue from his body of death. So he's saying that it's the physical, the physical is the problem. And so he's just looking forward to that day when he sheds the physical and then he's just this spirit being. But that again, doesn't really fit with the rest of scripture. Even Paul himself, if we look in Corinthians 1 Corinthians 15, 52, he's talking about when Christ returns. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So what's, what the Bible teaches us is not that we go on to become spirit beings for the rest of our lives, but rather 
you know, at our death, we're separated from our physical body. Our spirit goes on. But then at Christ's return, our body is resurrected, but resurrected imperishable. It's resurrected without sin. And so the spirit and the physical body are reunited, but the physical body is no longer this body of death that is corrupted by sin it is now an imperishable body. It is a body without death because it's without sin. So that's what he's looking forward to that day when this battle is no longer happening because there is no more sin. <clears throat> so thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, right? That's the, that's ultimately the hope. Our hope is only in Jesus Christ. This is the answer to the rhetorical question of who is going to, uh, to save us, and you know that's where our hope lies. Our hope doesn't lie in the law. It lies in Jesus Christ. Now, before this moment, we really just have two characters at play, right? You have sin, and you have that the mind that wants to follow God, and they're battling it out, and uh, so often sin is winning out you know, in that daily life. But now, to find the resolution, to find the hope, to find the, the answer, we have to look, like it brings in a third character, and that third character is Jesus Christ, right? So now we have someone who comes in from the outside, because internally we're losing this battle, comes in from the outside to rescue us, and that is the grace of Jesus Christ. That is where our hope is, and it's the only, uh, the only place to look. And we've talked a lot about the I in this passage. Well, notice that in this moment, it shifts back or shifts over to our, which really ties this into it, not just being Paul talking about his own personal struggle, but that this is the struggle that we all face. We all deal with this. And so he now brings this in. This is everyone's issue. And yet everyone's hope and everyone's answer in this is Jesus Christ. So then he finishes it up. Uh, so then I myself, that's an emphatic statement. I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. So, and I think that this is, this is really helpful as well because he brings it all back, right? He goes right back to, this is what the, the struggle of the, of the Christian life is. Right. I'm going to love the Lord with my mind, and yet I know I'm going to keep sinning so often. And that's the reality of it. So he never, he doesn't say, thanks be to God, and now I no longer sin. Right. It's It goes right back. Okay, so now I'm still in that struggle, but I'm in that struggle now with Jesus Christ as my Savior. Right. I'm in that struggle, but in that struggle, in the grace of Jesus Christ, the reality of the Christian's life returns. Uh, you know, it happens until Christ returns. However, it continues in the sure knowledge of the hope of Jesus Christ that God is saving him. Right. So what is the answer to the distress, to the turmoil, to being the wretched person that he is in this situation? It's Jesus Christ. And it can only be Jesus Christ. He is the one who comes from the outside and rescues us. We can't win it internally. And we see something similar that happens in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 57 to 58, where it says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That same statement of faith there from verse 25 in Romans 7. And then continues on, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, uh, in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So we have that statement of faith. This is where our salvation comes from. This is where our victory comes from. And then right back to living the Christian life. It's that same kind of, of, of idea. This time it's, it's less negative, right? It's not dealing with the struggle but rather the encouragement to now go and, and live as Christians. You put these two together and you see that you're going to do that, but you're also going to struggle with sin and fail. And you, you, know, you go to God for uh, in repentance for grace and mercy and, and forgiveness, and he gives that. And so um, it's also interesting here that the language where he says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory, it's really more of who is giving us the victory. It's, it's an ongoing act. Just like the struggle is an ongoing struggle, 
the salvation that God gives us is an ongoing salvation. He continues to save us. He continues to forgive us. And we live in that. So we live in this same situation of distress that Paul expresses here. And he describes it all through Romans 14 to 24. And Romans 25, it doesn't give us the answer to get out of that situation. Rather, it gives us the answer to the distress. It gives us the answer to how to live in that situation and have hope and know that salvation is still there, that it's there through Jesus Christ, that God is saving us through Jesus Christ who continues to save us and to whom we continue to return for forgiveness and strength and hope and grace and all of that. So we live as sinners, a sinner and saint at the same time, and our hope remains firmly and solely in Jesus Christ. So I think this is an awesome chapter of Romans. Of course, I think that about all of the chapters of Romans, but um, this one certainly hits us at home, I think, in their, just our daily struggle. So I hope you found encouragement here today, and I hope you cling to that, that, uh, that truth, that reality, that thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is our hope. That is where our victory comes from, and that is uh, how you live that day-to-day -day life in Christ. Amen? All right. Well, have a wonderful rest of the day. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God, and I'll see you tomorrow. God bless.